the little horn. Amen? So before we get into the Bible and before this presentation, let us go to God in prayers and let us ask for wisdom as he is willing to give us. Amen? Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for blessing us with another night, Lord. As we heard and felt the, the blessing that was from above, Lord, and now that you're clearing it up for us, Lord, it's just we, find, we see that we, we see favor in your eyes, Lord, and we will see that in Daniel 7, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you do. Give us an attentive mind, Lord, and listening ears. Be with me. Be with each and every one of us. Hide, us behind the, hide, me, hide me behind the cross, Lord, and may your name be lifted up. Thank you so much for all that you do. We love you, and we said his prayers, Father. In and through your Son, in Jesus' name, and we say amen. Amen. All right, ladies, thank you guys so much again for coming. So tonight, again, we'll be in uh, Daniel 7. So we, we'll see that in Daniel 7, there will be a lot of kingdoms that we'll be learning, as we know, the four great kingdoms. But it's so beautiful that no matter what, even though all these kingdoms were uh, rising and maybe taking down each other, no matter what, God's hand was on each and every one of them. Even though they may have written the, the history books as of their, in their ruling, we know that God had his hand on them, and God was in control of everything that was going on. And that is the same thing, too. In our lives, no matter what happened in our lives in the past, God is with us. And as I heard this from my, my buddy, our history is actually his story. Amen? Our history, anything that happened in the past is actually his story, and will glorify him, as we will see in Daniel 7 and on. Amen? So let us open up to the book of Daniel once again, and let us go to verse 1. So it says, in the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision on, of, of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. What did Daniel do? Daniel wrote down his dream, the dreams that God gave him. And that is something that we all should do. The reason why I say this is because, you know, it's good to write down our dreams, write down the visions that God has impressed on our hearts, not, not to show off or not to, any, not to do anything like that. But we would want to write it down and we want to test it to, the word, to God's word because it says, it, you can't really see it here, but it says that his word is like a lamp unto my feet and unto our path. Amen. So when we, whenever we have this vision, when we, whenever we have dreams, let us write it down and let God, and let us test it to the word of God. And so God can make it more clear to us what he would want us to do. Amen. So, and then one thing that I, I like about this too, we can go on. So in verse two, it says, Daniel spoke saying, I saw in my vision by night and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four beasts came from the sea, each different from the other. So we see that God is giving this vision for, uh, for the revealing of what, he, what God wants to reveal to the king. And that's something beautiful because in Amos 3, 7, it says, For the Lord, does not, um, the Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So we see that even from the very start of his dream that we already was in favor, um, God's people was already in favor because God didn't hide nothing from him. And that is the same thing for us. God does not hide, does not hide nothing from us. And he will reveal it through his, through his word and by, by his prophets, as we already know. And we already know in further studies, and we'll get into that maybe later on, that we have an end time uh, prophet that, can, that would help us guide, in, guide, guide our ways. Amen? So let us go on. It says uh, in verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagles with wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from earth and made, it, and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. So we see that this lion in Bible history and in, and, and, and in history itself is none other than Babylon. It reigned from 605 to 539 BC and we know that in Daniel 2 as Mark presented last night that the head of gold is is in parallel to this this beast of which is the lion basically what God did is he repeat and enlarge 
he used first a statue, then he used different symbols, which we we'll know, which we know from the Bible, what we're going to learn is the lion. So we'll learn more about it. And the, the reason um, why uh, we have this is parallel is because in the reign of, of, of Babylon, they were known for, you know, for, for their gold. So we see that it's even that much more evident that Bible and history matches up. So we'll, we'll learn. It says, so it says, the Lord will bring, bring a nation from you far away. Actually, let, let, us, let us read. Okay, so, it, so let us go down to what is the, what is the wings? Well, in wings in Bible prophecy or wings in the Bible is actually, it's, uh, it's like conquering fast. So we, we'll see in, in Deuteronomy 28, 49, it says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from far away from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language do not understand. So we understand that wings in Bible prophecy is actually, uh, how can I put this? It's speed. Thank you, Mark. It's actually speed. So we see that the lion, he had wings and he conquered, he conquered very fast. And that is the reason why the, the lion has wings. Amen? So let us continue. Um, let us continue in verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, was raised up on one side and had three teeth in its mouth. Between its teeth, it, um, ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said, thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. Amen. So we know that this beast right here, this bear, is none other than Medo-Persia that reigned from 539 to 331 BC. And one interesting fact is that the, the bear, it had three ribs in the mouth and one feet higher than the other. We will see the reason why it was like this in the Bible. So, and, and we would we like to correlate it too that um, the, in the Bible in Daniel 2, it was the, uh, uh, the chest of silver. And in, in, in Daniel 7, it's the bear. But, We'll see, we'll continue on and then we'll see more. And Middle Persia, the reason why it's silver is because they were known for their, uh, their silver things. Yeah, amen? <laughs> so we see it. Arms raised on one side, arms raised up on one side. The reason why one arm was raised up on one side is because Middle Persia was stronger than the Medes. The Medes and the Persians, they actually combined and they conquered many places. And that's the reason, but the the reason why one side is lifted up is because Persia was actually stronger than the Medes. And that's the reason why you see this and the Bible says that, that one side was actually raised up higher. And the reason why they have three, three ribs is because the Medes and the Persians, they conquered three nations in that time. And the three nations was actually Egypt, Babylon, and Lydia. Amen? So that's the reason why there is that three ribs in the mouth is because... Medo-Persia conquered three nations, three, three other small kingdoms, which was Egypt, Babylon, and Lydia. Amen? So let us move on. So it says in verse 6, And th I mean, after this I looked, and, three, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. And that is none other than Greece that ruled, over, that ruled between 531 to 168 B.C. And we already know that Greece was the, was the waste. And it paralleled because in this time, this is when um, King, uh, what is his name, Alexander the Great uh, reigned. And the reason why he had more wings on his back is because they, they conquered and they defeated more swiftly, more faster than the lion himself. And then when, when um, King Alexander died, Alexander the Great died because he, he got sick with malaria when he was in India. And then he came back home and he died in his hometown. But when he died, the, his four generals actually took over his, his ruling. And that is the reason why we have these four heads. And the four generals is Cassander, uh, Ptolemy, um, Antigonus, and Seculus. That is the four generals that made up the four heads after Alexander the Great passed away. Amen. 
So they, they reigned from 331, BC, 331 to 168 B.C., amen? So let us continue. It says, After this I saw in the night's vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was great from all the, from all the beasts that were before it, and it, it had ten horns. And we know that through history and Bible prophecy that this beast is none other than Rome. That reign, actually, in its power, it reigned from 168 B.C. to 476 A.D. Amen? So let's continue. And then we know that that's, that's the parallel between the, the legs, as we learned last night, and the, and the, the beast, which actually reign, um, they reign in the same time. So, we see that there was ten horns, amen? So, these ten horns represents the ten pagan godless fragments of the Roman Empire that became Europe today, amen? But we'll, then as we continue, it says that there was a little horn, amen? There was a little horn coming up, let, let us read in verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up, coming up among them. Before them, three of his first horns were plucked out of by, by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. If I was Daniel in my dream, I think I would be very disturbed because just the fact that out of these ten, these ten horns, that this horn was much more different. This horn actually had eyes and a mouth just like a man and a face like a man, and he was speaking pompous words. So if I was Daniel, I would be very, it says he was considering in my dream, if I was Daniel, I would be very, I would be like, man, let me pray about it and let me seek God and see what is this little horn is about. But by Bible, by history and Bible prophecy, we know that this little horn is none other than Papal Rome, that which reigned between this time, 538 AD to 70, 1798 AD. Amen. So we see that and it says, that, um, it says that this little horn came up among them and plucked out three other ones. So we'll see that what is the, what, what, what is the Bible saying as of the, the horn rising up and three, and, and he plucked out three and, he, and the reason why he gained his power. So we'll see that altogether there was actually ten, right? There were, there were ten horns there and each horn represented a nation, a kingdom. So, it's, so first it was the, the Alemannes, which is the Germans. I'll just read the, this part right here, which is modern-day Europe. The Germans, the Swiss, French, Italians, English, Portuguese, Spanish. But it says that it plucked out three of those horns, and that's how it gained its strength. So the three was the Hiroles, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. And because of that is the reason why the horn ended up becoming strong and gaining its power. First, he started off little, but over time, he ended up getting his strength, and he ended up becoming more prominent than the other ten. Amen? So we see through Bible history that it's proven more and more again that this little horn is none other than Papal Rome. Amen? So let us continue. Um, let, 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 us, let me ask this question right here. It's a, so right here is the question. Does the church of Rome fit the description of Daniel 8? Does the church of Rome fit the description of Daniel 8? Was the papacy a little horn, small kingdom? Yes, it is a small kingdom in Rome, amen? The next question, does the church of Rome fit the description of Daniel 8? Was this power difficult, I mean different, sorry, than the other kingdoms? Yes, it united the church, it united the church and state unlike any prior kingdom also it was both a religious and political power as we see we know that this little horn actually arise from rome in in a in a small town in a small uh in a small city called the vatican and that's and that's the reason why it's it it was both religious and political amen does the the church of rome fit the description of daniel 7 8 did it arise among the ten horns from the kingdom Yes, the ten kingdoms that arose out. Yes, the, thing, the ten kingdoms that arose out of the fallen empire 
encircles the Vatican City, as I mentioned earlier. Amen? So it says, does the Church of Rome fit the description of Daniel 7, 8? Did the papacy come up from, uh, from the breakup of Rome? Yes, it did. Yes, the, the ten divisions of Rome were placed when the papacy came to power. The Roman Empire ended about seven, uh, 476 AD and the papacy came fully to rule in 538 AD. Amen? So we see that the, the description of the little horn matches all, all these descriptions right here of what happened. It says, was the papal see a little horn? Yes, it was. Was this power different from the other kingdoms? Yes, it was. Did it arise among the ten kingdoms? Yes, it did. Did the papacy come up after the breakup of Rome? Yes, it did. Did it pluck up three kingdoms? Yes, we did, as we learned earlier. Did the papacy speak great words and have a, have a man at its head? Yes, it, yes, it did. So we'll see that... Um, the description that fits all of this is none other than Rome itself. But before that, it says that, this last one right here, did the papacy speak great words and have a man in his head? Yes, it did. And that man in his head, as we know today, um, I'm not trying to offend nobody or anything like that, is none other than the Pope. We know that the Pope is actually the head of the of the the papacy or or the the Vatican City as of right now is even to today, amen. So let us identify um, this little horn more and more, amen. So it says that this little horn had eyes and a mouth of a man, amen. It 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 uh, devastates the saints, opposes God, tries to change God's laws, tries to change God's times, tries uh, it speaks against God and seeks dominion. It basically do, it does opposite actually from what Christ came down on here for. As we know, Christ became the son of man. This little horn had, the, had a mouth and eyes of a man. He tried to be God himself. And it says, so we see that Christ, he shares the kingdom with his saints. The little horn devastates the saints, amen? Christ glorifies God. The little horn, horn opposes God. Christ upholds and fulfills God's law. The little horn tries to change God's law, and so on and so on. Amen? So we see that the, this little horn, it, it's, it's been identified more and more of, of papal Rome or none other than the, than the ruling of, oh, of the little, uh, the Pope itself. Amen? So sorry about that. So it says, it says um, in verse, let me read. So it said in verse 8 during the ending, And there in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man, and mouth speaking pompous words. Pompous words is basically like blasphemy. So what is the qualification of blasphemy? So we found, in, we find in the Bible in Luke, in Luke 12, 10, that blasphemy is basically forgiving people. And today in the, in the church, in, in, the, in, in the system now, it's not the people, it's the system that they, they claim to forgive man of sin. But we know that the only person who can forgive sin is actually God himself and Jesus Christ. But we see, the, we see definitions of what is blasphemy. What did Jesus was accused for? It says, and everyone in Luke, in Luke 12, 10, and everyone who spoke who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Basically, the people, the Pharisees, was, was saying that the reason why Jesus said that he could forgive man for them sins, for the sins, is why the reason he was being accused of, of a blasphemer. And, and the other one is basically going against the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we see that this little horn claims to forgive sin and goes against the Holy Spirit. Amen? So that another verse that we identify, what is blasphemy, is in John 10, 29, verse 33. It says, My Father has given to, to me, My Father who has given to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones against him, Jesus answered, 
I have shown you, shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? So you see the reason why you see the reason why they wanted to stone Jesus is because he was basically saying that him and the Father is one and that he is God. Amen. So the Jews says, answered, answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because being a man, make yourself God. So we see the two identification as blasphemy. It is actually claiming to forgive sin and um, you know, rejecting the Holy Spirit. But more, more so, it is claiming to be God. And today, the system of, the, of papal Rome claims to forgive God. As we know, if we do more studies, we'll understand. And like what it says, the system, not the people. Amen? So it says, so, so let, let, let's actually read on. Amen? So let's go to verse 9 if you have your Bible. It says, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was fiery flame, its wheels are burning fire, a burning fire. So let us look at what, who's, let us identify, I, did, I don't have the slides here, but let us identify the Ancient the ancient of days amen so he say you see that the ancient of days is actually capitalized it's capitalized ancient and capitalized days we're gonna find out who's actually this ancient of days more and more okay so in verse 10 a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him and thousand and thousand thousands ministered to him ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the courts were seated and the books were open so you see that the books was open and why it's because it's because the ancients of days was seated and the, the ancient of days is actually none other than God the Father we'll see later in, in the later verses why okay and the books that was being presented was open was actually the book of the book of life the book of remembrance and the book of deeds that it was being examined amen and these thousands and thousands that was ministering to him was actually angels, as we read in, in Bible prophecy and, and as we read in the Bible, that the, these thousands of thousands is actually angels. Amen? So it says in verse 11, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the great beast was slain and, the body, and its body destroyed and given to burning flames. To the burning flames. Amen? Verse 12, and for the rest of the beasts, when they had their minute, their, their minute taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. So we see that this beast, that this beast, this beast who spoke pompous words, actually was defeated. It was actually taken down. So that is already a great news on our behalf, on behalf of the saints. We know that God is, vic is victorious in the end. So we'll read on in verse 13. I was watching on the night's vision, and behold, one like a son, like the son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. So now we can identify more who's the ancient of days. Some may think that is Jesus Christ, but it, that is actually not Jesus Christ. That is actually God the Father, because what in verse in verse thirteen it says, and behold. One like the Son of Man coming with clouds of heaven, the clouds is, heaven, is the angels. He came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Amen. Let us go to this quote from Ellen G. White. It's in the Great, Great Controversy 88, 479. Okay? It says, The coming of Christ here described is not his second coming to earth. He comes to the Ancient of Days in heaven to receive dominion and glory and kingdom which will be given him at the close of his work as a mediator it is this coming not the second coming advent to the earth that was foretold in prophecy to take place at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844 attended by heavenly angels our great high priest enters the holy of holies and there appears in his presence of God, in the presence of God. 
to engage in the last acts of his ministration in the behalf of man to perform the works of investigation, the investigative, investigative judgment and to make an atonement for all who were shown to be entitled to his benefit. The reason why I'm pointing this out is because a lot of people, they, um, when we don't study enough or we don't study deep, a lot of people, when they think that this scene actually, actually right here is when Jesus comes down to, to earth at his second coming. But clearly it says that it, it is the coming of Christ in this scene here is not described as his second coming to earth. But it's actually Jesus moving from the holy place to the most holy place to start the investigative judgment. And that's the reason why the books was opened up. So they could investigate and they could, um, they could judge. They could judge what is going down here on earth. But we shouldn't be afraid of this investigative judgment because this investigative judgment is actually vindicating us, God's people, on behalf of Christ. As long as we repent of our sins, as long as we give our hearts to God and we give everything to Him, Jesus is already investigating. He's showing God on what He, what we are, what he has done on our behalf and what we are doing as we're repenting of our sins and we're giving everything to Him. Amen? So let us, let us keep in mind that this investigative judgment of Jesus going from the holy to the most holy place is not the second coming of Christ, but is actually Christ going to the most holy place to start the investigative judgment on our behalf. That's why it says that to perform the, the work of investigate, the investigative, investigative judgment and to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to his benefits. God, Jesus is atoning for us for all, for, for, for all that he had done, as long as we give ourselves to him, amen? So that is the thing. As long as we repent of our sins, we don't have to worry about what's going on because God will, be, will take care of us, amen? So we see right here a beautiful picture of, of what can happen in heaven, amen? And the reason why we shouldn't, like what it said, we shouldn't be afraid of the investigative judgment is because Jesus is vindicating on our behalf. He is showing to God that we have repented and we have uh, done all that we had to do and that whatever the devil may have accused us from the past, whatever that the devil tried to bring up from all of our past history, Jesus is on our behalf showing that God, that we have repented and he and because of his blood we are made clean amen so in other words we shouldn't be afraid because the judgment that is happening in heaven it was actually found in favors of the saint amen so let, let us actually go to the bible so it says it says over here let, let us start in verse 25 he shall speak pompous words, this is Satan, among the Most High, and shall persecute the saints to the Most High, and shall in, intend to change times and laws. The saints shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. This right here we'll be learning tomorrow, more and more tomorrow. Amen? This is um, none other than the Dark Ages. Verse 26. But the courts shall be seated. And they shall take away his dominion, which is the enemy, which is Satan, to consume and destroy it. So we've already seen what happened in verse, in verse 11. That the, this great beast was, was destroyed and given to the burning flame. But Daniel, he sees uh, God reveals it to him more. Amen? So then we see in verse 27. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. So we see at the end that no matter what happened in history, no matter what happened in all these times from, from Babylon to Medo Persia to Greece to Rome to Paper Rome, and even to now, we don't have to be afraid because when Christ comes back, we'll, the, the kingdom will be found in favor of us but the only thing that we have to do as followers of Christ as Christians 
is give ourselves to God, repent of our sin. Because why? Because the whole, because every, the heaven, the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey Him. And for me, my sisters, I'm going to end this real quick. For me, as a follower of Christ, if I want to be with Jesus, if I want to be in that, that kingdom that He promises us, I would have to give up my sins. I would have to give up my always because we know that Christ, like I said, is vindicating on our behalf. He is making everything clear to, the, to God that we are His saints, we are, we, we are His children. But we have to give ourselves over to Him. We have to give up our, our, our sins and anything, anything that is holding us back. And, if, and I, I would like to make a, a little appeal, appeal. And if that is you who would want to be part of this kingdom and we, you know that Jesus is on your side, I would like you guys to stand up right now if this is you. And we would like to pray for you. And if you, if you want to be part of this kingdom, let us pray to God. And let us come to Him. And let us say, we give ourselves to Him. We give ourselves to what He has done for us on the cross. Amen. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you for vindicating on our behalf, Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for doing all that you do, Lord, on our behalf. Lord, I know that you're up there investigating the books for to vindicate and to show that we are your children we are your saints but we would want to give our sins over to you lord whatever is not found in in the book of forgiveness lord in in, in you we know that it will be destroyed and we won't want to be destroyed on here on earth we would want to be we would want to take this this kingdom we would want to take hold of what you have done for us lord thank you so much for doing all of this on our behalf lord and never giving up on us we love you so much and we say these prayers father in and through your son jesus name and we say amen